of God this morning. I have been tremendously blessed by the song service that we've had. I think if we if we pay attention to the songs that we've been singing, I think we've we've heard a lot of the gospel message this morning. I want to welcome each one of you to the further service this morning. Uh, I want to uh, welcome you here. This last song that we sang has, has really challenged me. Uh, will your anchor hold? Do you have an anchor this morning? Is that anchor, is it set, and is it founded on the rock? And when the storm clouds roll in and the storms of life come rolling through, and as it talks about those cables, when those cables start straining, will your anchor hold? I am convinced this morning that if your anchor, if it is founded on Jesus Christ, no matter what storm comes your way, it will hold. No matter what comes your way in life, that anchor will never move. Some of the other songs that we had, we had uh, sung this morning before Sunday school, I'm going to just go through a couple of them. There's some, there's some really, uh, there's some inspiration uh, it was to me in those songs. The one of them that really uh, got me thinking was, was number 947 in the hymnary. We, we seldom sing some of these songs out of the hymnary. But it was the heavens are lowering overcast. And it goes, it says, the heavens are lowering overcast. I hardly see blue canopy, yet bright and clear storms mass, bright, bright, bright and clear or stormy mass. My Savior, kind, my Savior's kindly eye I see. So even in the middle of all this gloom and in the middle of all the storms that are rolling through, you're still able to see the Savior's eye. He says, I'll gladly come. I love the chorus of this song. It says, I'll gladly come. I'll gladly come to thee. But if thou doest, it says, but if thou doest to stay, decree in storm and labor, I will stand. We are able to stand in storm and in labor. We are able to stand if our anchor is founded on that rock. It says in verse 2, it says, The storm is raging fearfully, and Satan's sore my soul intrigues. Though night be darkening cheerlessly, I know that my Redeemer lives. Even in the midst of the storms that are raging around us, we still know and we are convinced and we know truthfully in our heart that our Savior lives and that he is alive. Verse 3, it says, My Father's house of blessedness, not earthly storms, my soul would see. Lord, I would find eternal rest in thee, wilt thou my soul receive. And then we also had uh, number 175, and I love that song. I love the words of that song. Jesus, thy boundless love to me. And it says, Jesus, thy boundless love to me. No thought can reach, no tongue declare. Unite my thankful heart to thee. Is that our desire this morning, that our heart is united with the heart of Jesus Christ? And it says, and reign without a rival there. In Sunday school this morning, we talked about all the different things that, that can become gods in our life. That, that can become idols, idolatry. And here it says that he desires to have Jesus reigning in his heart without a rival there. Jesus must reign alone. It says, thine holy and thine alone I am, my soul with constant love aflame. Thy love, how cheering is its ray, all pain before its presence flies, care and anguish, sorrow melt away wherever its healing beams arise. O oh Jesus, nothing may I see, nothing desire or seek but thee. And then in the last verse it says, In suffering be thou, be thy love my peace. Even in the midst of suffering is Jesus Christ, is he our peace. In weakness, be thy my love, be thy love my power. 
Even in the times where we are weak, his love in our life is our power. And when the storms of life shall cease, Jesus in that, in that important hour, in death, as life be thou my guide, and save me who for me has died. We also sang another song and talks about us being the channel, channels only. Are we this morning, are we the channel of Jesus Christ? Are we allowing him to flow through us? Are we allowing him to work through us? Are we being a channel for Jesus Christ this morning? In our Sunday school lesson, it talked about moving on to perfection. And I shared that it, it seems so often I look back at my life and I look at where I am and, and I think, man, there were so many times that I allowed myself to just become complacent. And I kind of lost my, my fervor. And I see all those times, if I would have, if I would have kept on, how much, how much further would I have grown than I am now? Are we pressing on to perfection? Or are we still sitting here years and years have gone by and we're still sitting here as babes drinking milk and not being skillful in the word of God? It's sad to think about it, but it is a reality. Or have we moved on and are we eating milk or are we eating the meat that he has for us? And maturing in our life. I want to turn the time over to Brother Felix. Uh, before we do that, let's all stand and we're going to sing uh, a song, Come Bless the Lord, and we're going to have a prayer and turn the time over to Brother Felix. Come bless the Lord, bless the Lord. all you servants of the Lord. Father, we come before you this morning with thankful hearts. We thank you for what you've done for us. We thank you for your many blessings. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather together in this way this morning, Lord, unhindered. Just pray that you would be with each one that is here. Help us, Lord, that we could gather together here with open hearts and open minds and that we can hear of your word. Just pray, Lord, that you would be with Brother Felix as he shares. Lord, just give him words to speak. Just help him, Lord, to preach your word, what you have put on his heart, Lord, and to preach it without the fear of man. Help us, Lord, that as we receive what is given, that we can apply it to our life and that we could allow it to bring forth fruit in our life, that it can glorify and that it can honor you. Lord, that people can see that as it grows in our life, that it ultimately that they would honor and glorify you because of it. Just pray, Lord, that you would be with us. Keep us, Lord in your care and keeping. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Brother Matt, for what you shared. I want to welcome each one to the further service this morning. It's a blessing to be in the house of God. And I want to welcome our visitors as well. Hope that we can all benefit from what God has for us this morning. I wasn't here last Sunday, um, but I did listen in. How many of y'all remember what the message was about last Sunday? Joe? What was it? The finished work of Christ. I, I heard him, heard Brother Noah say it is finished numerous times. And uh, I think it was a very, very timely message. Um, 
July 9th, my brother Edwin was born on this day 47 years ago. And uh, I vaguely remember being in the house when he came home from the hospital, probably two, two and a half years old. Our house wasn't quite finished. Dad built a split level house. And we had just started using the middle level. We had been living in the basement. We started using the middle level. I remember seeing my mom sitting on the, on the couch in the living room there with my little baby brother, just vaguely. So the subject this morning, as we have been talking about God's design for the home, uh, I've preached two messages that were directed primarily to the men. And this morning I would like to preach a message that involves um, the wife, the godly wife. And while this message is primarily going to be for our sisters, it's not exclusively for them. Uh, <clears throat> I think we as, as husbands, as men, can also get some benefit and children and youth here as well. And so I want to just uh, want to enter this thing very uh, prayerfully. I don't, I don't want to speak out of turn. I don't want to share a lot of opinions. I want to just look at the Word of God. And I believe if we can look at the Word of God and just um, receive what God says, we might be surprised at some of the things that we find. Um, some of the presuppositions that we have might be challenged just a little bit. And, um, but yeah, I want God to be honored and glorified by what we share this morning. So let's turn to Ephesians 5 again. We've been there the last two messages. <clears throat> Ephesians 5, and let's just begin in uh, verse 20. It says, Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but, it, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own body, bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. I'm going to leave it there and uh, turn to Colossians 3.18, just a few pages over. Well, let's start in verse 16. I'd like to get a little context. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things. For this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Through, all of the, through, through these passages here, I just want us to get a picture of what God's heart is for the home, and specifically what God's heart is for the order in the home, what we commonly call the headship order. And in both of these passages, uh, written by the Apostle Paul, he's laying out the order and he's making a comparison of a wife submitting to the husband um, I'm sorry, I thought I saw that in this passage. I think there's another passage that I read in studying 
where it makes a comparison of the wife submitting to the husband, um, compares that to the church submitting to Christ. And so that is a, a picture. That is, that is what God is, is setting forth in the home. There is a little phrase in verse 18 here that I find interesting. It says, as it is fit in the Lord. And, uh, and so that would, that would qualify the statement just a little bit um, because Paul would have been writing to, in many cases, women who were married to unsaved husbands. And so obviously there would have been times where maybe an unsaved husband would ask something of a wife that was not fitting in the Lord. And so there was need for discernment for the wife in that situation. I would, I guess, say something that is, should be obvious to all of us, and that is that this biblical doctrine of headship and the headship order has really fallen on hard times. Um, our culture, the world, rejects this doctrine very, very strongly. Um, there is very, very little room in our culture for this kind of an argument. Although, interestingly, there is kind of a backlash, if you will, to uh, the women's liberation movement, even in popular culture. And uh, there is kind of an examining of what the, uh, the thrust of the, the feminist movement has done to society and what the chaos that it has caused in society, and people are actually taking an honest look at what it has done um, regarding, especially regarding the fact that there's so many uh, single moms in society today, and what that has done, how that has destroyed society, and there's a lot of, a lot of people out there that are actually calling for this thing of, you know, a home, and a two-parent home, and in order for that to happen, there has to be some changes because the way things are set up right now in society, it's incredibly destructive. And we, we understand that. We know that. And it's, it's obvious that uh, the world, inspired by the voice of the devil, voice of the enemy, has just has, has waged war against God's word and what God says is right and good. I would also like to say that when we study the Word of God, when we look at what God says, when we look at this idea of biblical headship, this is a, a thing that God, it was God's idea. It's not man's idea. And so, just as a general principle, whenever we look at the Word of God and we see something here, a principle or a, a, something that is set forth in the Bible, Many times our tendency as humans is to think this is going to interfere with my happiness. This is going to restrict my freedom. This is going to impose hardship on me if I, if I follow what the Word of God says. And I think it's always good for us to remember, you know, He made us. He knows what's best for me. He knows what ultimately will bring the most, the best outcome in my life. And I can surrender to him. I know that's a basic idea. But we all struggle with this thing of, if I fully surrender to the will of God, if I fully just, just say, Lord, I want to follow you in everything. I want to turn my life completely over to your will. I want to obey you in everything. I want to surrender it all. We're a little bit afraid of where that's going to take us. I'm very familiar with that feeling. We all have this tendency of, I would like to retain a little bit of control in my life. And there's areas of our life that we have a hard time just saying, Lord, I'm going to surrender that to you. And in this area of, of headship can especially be one that <clears throat> is a struggle. For, for the ladies, especially if we as men are negligent, are complacent, 
and are not tuned in to meeting the needs of our wives. Um, and I've, I've, I've emphasized this before. One of the things that one of my Facebook friends has emphasized a lot is the fact that a woman, a woman needs to feel safe and cared for. Those two basic things. If a woman feels safe and cared for, um, she'll flourish. But if she feels neglected and not safe, she'll react out of fear and she will not, she will not be a happy wife in the home. And so, but again, God has set this up. God has set up the home. And if we look at a godly home, if we look at a husband and a wife who are working in harmony, who are raising children in a safe environment, who are doing the best that they know how to honor God and to follow his patterns and to bring up children that are, that are safe, that are loved, that are cared for, that are in an environment where they know they're loved unconditionally and where they also will be corrected if, if they need to be. There's not chaos in the home. A home where the father is taking his responsibility seriously as a spiritual leader, who is a man of integrity, not perfect, but he is. He is in the word. He is humble. He is receiving love from God, knowing he is accepted by God, knowing that he is a child of God, not striving, constantly striving to just produce good works out of his own efforts, but just walking in the knowledge that he is a child of God and he's, he's ministering to his wife. He's praying for her. He's forgiving when she um, fails, when she, when she, you know, acts out of fear. And a wife then who also is also walking in humility, acknowledging when she fails, who is, is taking it seriously, who is, who is really desiring to serve the Lord, really desiring to walk in humility, acknowledges when she makes mistakes and is, yeah, that, that whole picture there is just such a beautiful picture in our world today. It's something that people long for. It's something that is very rare. And I don't, I don't think we understand or realize how rare it's becoming to have a home that is orderly, to have a home that's loving, to have a home that's safe, where we can go and just be ourselves, where we can go and relax, and there's peace there, and there's acceptance there, and there's forgiveness there, and there's the ability to communicate and share your heart. That's a beautiful thing. And I don't think any of us here should ever uh, take that for granted or just feel like, you know what, it's just going to happen regardless of whether I put effort into it or not. It's, not, it's going to go away if you don't put effort into it, if you don't pay attention to it. Not in a striving or stressed out way, but in a way that you're, just, you're coming to it and you're saying, Lord, just show me and lead me and help me in this regard. The idea today, as I said already, that a wife is to obey her husband, it's a very countercultural idea in our world today. It wasn't so countercultural in Paul's day when he wrote this. In Paul's day, it was more countercultural or odd that a man would lay down his life for his wife. In Jewish, um, in, in Jewish culture, it was very male dominant. Um, they, they had things in place and customs and the way things were done. Women were not allowed to sit in certain parts of the synagogue and some of those things were, were very much reserved only for the males. And so the idea that the wife was to obey her husband, that was just a given. That was understood in that culture. And so that was not a foreign idea. I don't know, did the, did the Jewish women struggle with, with the idea? Or I'm, I'm sure being human, they probably did. But it was, it was a very um, accepted thing. But again, the, the sacrificial love that Paul, under the inspiration of the Spirit, 
taught the men. That was revolutionary. And that was notable. There's a story that, talking about this thing of submission, I don't know if y'all remember when uh, Brother Chente was here years ago and he talked on this subject, but he had a story that sort of stuck in my mind. I thought it'd be good to share it. He said there was a young man who told his, his dad he'd like to get married. And so his dad said, well, he said, before you do, I want you to do an experiment just so you can learn some things. He said, I want you to go and uh, take two horses and take a bunch of roosters. Take a, a nice black horse and a nice white horse and visit all the homes in this area. And when you come to their front yard, leading these horses and with the roosters, ask them, ask the, the man and the wife, is this home, uh, is, is the man the leader in this home? Does the man have the final say in this home? And uh, so he did this. And he just, he had a hard time finding a home where that was actually the case. So he was going from place to place and he was frustrated. He finally got to this place and he come up to the yard and he asked the question, you know, is the man um, the authority in this home? And they said, yes. The man said confidently, yes, I am the authority in this home. Uh, I am the leader and my wife listens to me. And so he says, very well, finally found one. And so he says, well, which horse do you want? And the husband says, I'll take the black one. And the wife says, no, we'll take the white one. And so the guy says, I'm sorry, you're going to have to get a rooster. That was Chente's story. Uh, so anyway, how do we... How do we frame this thing of headship order? I think it's important that we actually possess a biblical understanding of the roles God has designed and the value that God places on men and women. I want to emphasize that as men and women, we have equal value. We have equal access to God, the work of redemption, Power and prayer, it's all the same. We're on an equal footing. Men and women are expressions, different expressions of the image of God. We're both, both men and women are all created in the image of God. We, we, we present a different aspect of the character and the person of God. Christianity elevates and frees women to be exactly what they were created to be, which is image bearers of God, filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, able to love unconditionally because they are loved unconditionally. Let's go to Galatians 3. <clears throat> Verse 25. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster, for ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus." And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. <laughs> Just notice what the scripture says. There is neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ. There is no difference. I'd like to look just briefly at uh, women in the New Testament. 
I don't think we have time to go through the Old Testament, although there's many examples in the Old Testament, faithful women. And I just want to emphasize again to the ladies, I don't want to have you come and you know, hear this message and feel condemnation and feel like I just need to try harder or I just need to get my act together. I feel like a lot of times when there's, when there's a message that's given in that way, in a, in a, in a, in a way that, that a woman feels condemned where, she, where she's at or, or her, her failures just discourage her, uh, something, something should um, be presented maybe a little bit differently. Because whenever I read um, in the New Testament, I see such a redemptive story. I see such a, a, a story of just hope and um, just God meeting people where they are and changing them and empowering them and just people flourishing because of what God is doing in their life. We can't be something we're not. That's an obvious statement. We can try. We can make effort. We can stress ourselves out. But if it doesn't flow from something that God is doing in our life, it's just human effort. It's all it amounts to. On the other hand, if we can understand, all of us, that we're a child of God, that it's his work in my life, it's his transforming power in my life that changes me and enables me, then it, the, whole, the whole picture changes because it's no longer my efforts. It's him working in and through me. Does that make sense? I hope it does. I'd like to just emphasize or point out some examples in the New Testament, in the Gospels. Jesus had his 12 disciples, but there were also women um, counted among his disciples that some of them actually were wealthy and they, they financed um, his earthly ministry. There were women, mostly women, at the crucifixion because the disciples had fled. I think John was there, but other than that, his mother Mary and, and um, I think two other women were present at least at his crucifixion. It was a woman who first saw Christ. At least in one gospel it says Mary Magdalene. I think in another gospel there was more than one woman there. And Jesus communicated a message through her. She said, go and tell my brethren um, that I ascend to the Father. And so he entrusted her with that message. In Acts 2, when Peter began to preach, he quoted the prophet Joel. Let's turn to Acts 2. I think it's valuable. Verse 17. He's quoting the prophet Joel, Old Testament prophet. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Did you notice that it's both genders are prophesying? Both genders are filled with the Spirit. They are ministering. They are speaking up. I think sometimes as we look at these, <clears throat> at these scriptures, sometimes we have a little bit of a yeah but. Um, mindset or thought and we think well you know yeah but we don't want women preachers and that's that's fine I'm not making that 
argument. I am, I am perhaps making an argument that women maybe could give testimony and maybe could be a little more expressive in our congregation, not fearing that they're going to feel or they're going to be marked as somebody that's forward. My thought is, if you have something to say, if you have a word of testimony, if you want to share something in church, do it. And don't, don't feel intimidated by a stereotype or a cultural thing where you feel like you've got to be, you know, we're going we're gonna to get to that. Um, well, I say we are. We all know that verse where Paul says women should not exert authority over men in church, and that's, that's fine. But I think there's a lot of room for women in the church to minister and to speak, especially when it comes to teaching other women and when it comes to teaching children. There's a lot of room for, for women to use their gifts in the church. And I think sometimes they're very underused. We're going to look at some other scriptures. In Romans 16... I better hurry, I won't get done. <clears throat> I'm going the wrong way here. Romans 16, verse 1. I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is at Centria, that ye receive her in the Lord as become a saint, and that ye assist her in whatsoever business she hath need of, for she hath been a succorer of many, and of myself also. It's interesting if you study the the, the original language. My understanding is I'm not a I'm not a Greek student, but my understanding is that when the word servant there was translated, it's the same word uh, diakonos, which would be deacon. And so it's possible she was a deaconess. Um, in the same chapter here, we have numerous salutations. Um, when Paul mentions, in verse 3, Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, he mentions them both, actually mentions her name first. Uh, greet Mary in verse 6, who bestowed much labor on us. Salute Andronicus and Junia. Uh, Junia is a woman's name. My kinsmen and my fellow prisoners. Uh, this is, these are women who were very active in ministry. Um, there's others. Verse 12, Tryphena and Tryphosa, who labor in the Lord. Um, verse 15, Philologus and Julia. Nereus and his sister and Olympus. So he's mentioning a lot of women by name who were active in the ministry, who were active in serving. And so I think that kind of can give us perspective on what the early church, how the early church used women in the church. Now, there is an interesting thing. Uh, some of the people who study early church history would have noticed that the, in, you know, in that time, in the pagan era, uh, baby girls were often abandoned and left to die. And the Christians came along and they valued life and so they would rescue these girls and raise them as their own. So they were, they, there was way more women in the churches than there were men. And also when they made converts, often in higher society classes, the, the women would receive the gospel and the men would not because they, they feared losing their status or their their position. And so that was kind of an interesting dynamic regarding the early church. So it's possible because there were so many more women, there was more opportunity for the women to serve. However, I believe it's still um, good for us to see this. In Acts 21, verse 9, we have the three daughters of Philip the Evangelist who prophesied. And uh, so we have that. So Having established that perhaps sometimes we, we, we don't use our women as much as we could, um, what is God's ideal for the home? What is God's ideal for the Christian home? 
there is, there is this order. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 11, we have the headship order. We've, I think we've read enough scriptures this morning to understand where we're, where we're going with this. But 1 Corinthians 11 talks about uh, Christ being first, the man is under Christ, the woman is under the man, and then um, that is a depiction of Christ and the church and how all those things should follow their natural order. We know just as a natural thing that men are more aggressive by nature, men are, are physically stronger, men have more of a, a predisposition to deal with things or to be interested in things. Women have more of a predisposition to, to be interested in people and relationships. And so we're actually wired differently. Um, this is generally speaking. And so if we follow the natural giftings that are there, men are called to be protectors, providers, leaders, and uh, that is what we're nat naturally predisposed to do. Women are naturally predisposed to be nurturing, to be teachers of children, and to understand relationships, and so, you know, to help their husbands understand relationships. So when a husband and a wife are in a harmonious, loving relationship, they work as a team. They both bring their strengths and their gifts to the table, and they encourage and build each other up, and everything works just beautifully. And maybe we could just close the subject and go on. Unfortunately, because we also are fallen people, it doesn't always just work beautifully. We have, we have our issues. We have our hang-ups. We have things from the past, perhaps, that have shaped, have shaped us and have affected the way we see things. And many times because you know, opposites attract, we might have a very passive man and a very aggressive woman come into a marriage. And now what do you do? How do you make this work? How do you follow God's design? And I think those are things that we have to, to look at. And a husband and a wife need to um, just look at it honestly and discuss it honestly. Look at the word of God. What is God calling us to do? What are we supposed to be modeling? How are we supposed to be coming into this union and being harmonious and living out what God has planned for men and women? I would just ask just a few questions, I guess. First of all, and I think they're just key questions. The first one I would ask to our sisters is, are you connected to the vine? We know the scripture very well, the vine and the branches. Do you have a vital relationship with God through Jesus Christ that gives you life, that nurtures your soul, that makes you understand that you're loved unconditionally by God? Because if that's missing in your life, you're going to try to draw that from your husband. And he's not equipped to give you that. And I'm not giving your husbands an out. But I'm just saying it doesn't matter how spiritual he is. He's not equipped to give you that. And so that is primary. If, if that's not. Um, if, that's, if there's just been a block in your understanding of Christianity. To where you have not really connected with God. And you don't feed on. You don't, you don't just understand that you are loved unconditionally as a child of God, then there's, you know, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. There's just going to be this constant struggle to prove that you're valuable, to prove that you are worthy, to prove that you are um, worthy of love. And it's going to manifest itself in some really nasty ways. And so I just... My, my heart's cry is that all of us could find ourselves connected to the vine and receiving love from God because it's only as we receive that that we're able to give it. If we don't receive it, we're dry and we're struggling and we are unable to.
to love, to love others selflessly. The second question I would have is, are you content with the man God gave you? That's a pretty big question, because many times, I think, um, you know, relationships begin, and we've got a lot of courting couples here, we've got some really young married couples here, and so, you know, when you're, when you're in the courtship phase, everything looks great, you might see some flaws, but as a woman, you might look at this guy, and you might think, wow, you know, He's just the diamond in the rough. I'm going to, you know, just like that song says, I'm going to make him shine. And uh, you, have that, you have that idea. You know, he's got these issues, but I'm just going to bring the best out of him. And you get married, and somehow he just sort of stays there because we don't change that easy. And we sure don't change when a woman's trying to change us, unfortunately. And so, back to the question. I sort of went on a rabbit trail there, but back to the question. Are you content with the husband you have? It's a valid question. And I would just encourage you to examine your heart. Are you content? If you're not, he's going to know it. Because you're going to let him know. Maybe not directly, but he will know that he is not meeting your expectations and that you are disappointed in him. And that'll just create distance between you. That'll just create frustration. That'll just create all kinds of of issues. Um... Boy, it's just quiet in here. <clears throat> I feel like about to sing or something. Uh, one of the beautiful things of, about marriage is just this thing of to know each other well and to love each other in spite of the flaws. And <clears throat> I hope you don't get from what I'm the things I'm sh- I'm sharing here that I'm sharing anything out of frustration with our marriage. Our marriage is not perfect. I'm, I'm just going to tell you that right now. Um, I have a good wife. And I, I didn't know her very well when we got married. She didn't know me very well. She had all these lofty expectations probably. And, and uh, you know, it turns out I'm just this guy raised in the jungle. And uh, <laughs> with very little refinement. And... So we all enter this thing, this relationship with the expectations, and then the expectations aren't met. And it can happen from both sides, and you're frustrated, and you're like, man, I didn't know I married this person. And why can't they change? And why can't they meet my needs? And why can't they understand me? And, but if we, on the other hand, we can just say, you know what? I'm a child of God. He's a child of God. I'm going to walk with the Lord I'm going to love this man in spite of his flaws. I'm going to accept him unconditionally. I'm going to encourage him. I'm going to help him. But I'm not going to rule over him. I'm not going to try to manipulate him. I'm sure not going to put him down. Then it can work. The third question I would have is, where do you find your value as a woman? Where do you find your value? What makes you feel like you're valuable? I mentioned this earlier, our actions always follow our beliefs. If you feel what gives you value is the fact that you cook a good meal, or you have good wisdom and insight, or you keep a home that's spotless and clean, or your children are well-behaved, or any of these other things, if that is where you find your value, 
then the minute those things change, you're going to struggle. The minute that thing is just not that way anymore, you're going to be, you're going to be upset. You're not going to be happy. And just, I just point back to the, you know, the thing that I've been emphasizing. If you find your value, if you understand that you have value because of what we read in Galatians, because in Christ, in Christ, we're sons and daughters. In Christ, we are in him. And we have value because he is our father. He loves us. He paid the ultimate price to make us his, his children. Then, and that is our starting point. That's our, that's our base. And that's what we're founded upon, on that rock, on that knowledge, on that belief, and nothing is moving that, then we won't have to find our value in these other things. That's not to say that these other things aren't, aren't worth pursuing. Every man, I know every man out there likes to have a clean home and a good meal and, you know, a happy wife when he gets home. All those things are important. But if that, if that is where you're finding your value, then we may have some things backwards. I believe I'm going to... There's a lot more that could be said, I guess. Um, but my time is out. And so we'll see what the Lord has the next time. Um, I hope you can I hope you can take what I say with you know just look at the scripture if there's anything, anything I've said that's not biblical or scriptural just let me know and um, I'll be happy to correct it but again God has our best interests at heart um, he calls us his sons and his daughters and he is he's just yeah he calls us into these um, this relationship with him that will be a, a picture, an illustration, a manifestation of who Christ really is. And so my prayer is that we can all model that, both men and women, and um, keep growing in the Lord and keep ministering to one another, ministering to everybody in our sphere of influence. And, uh, yeah, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for wives. We thank you, Lord, that you've put everything in its place. You've given us everything that we need for life and godliness. And, Lord, as we, as we look at the word and as we we see need for growth in our lives. God, I just pray that we could approach it not from a place of condemnation, but from a place of, Lord, you love me, and this looks impossible to me, but if you will enable me, if you will give me grace, I know all things are possible. And Lord, we just, we come to you in that spirit. We just pray, God, that you would enable us. We see, we see room for for growth we see past failures we see things that we should have done differently and we just pray lord that you would show us and that you would give us both the will to do it and the ability because that's what you've promised we pray this in jesus name amen let's have a song
I can say amen to the message. Uh, he said it was a message primarily maybe towards the ladies, but I thought there was plenty of it in that applied to my life as well. Uh, he was talking about marriage, and I had to think of what my wife has always has, has often told me. She said, when we got married, she said, I came with fine print. I guess she failed to read all the fine print. But I can say after, after 19 years of marriage, we're, we're closer now than we've ever been before. So I want to I praise God for that. I want to praise God for the message that we've heard. I was very encouraged. I want to open it up. If there's anyone here who has uh, something you want to share, the time is yours. Anyone else? Thank you for that, Paul. Anyone else?
Anyone else? I appreciated just hearing uh, the ideal. Didn't take any amount of time on social media or just the news to hear how crazy things have become. Because we come to a, a service this morning and gather as brothers and sisters. And to hear and lift it up, what the word says, it just gives such hope. says to the man, I see you've got two horses that are loose turned. Let me just hear from my wife a little bit about her thoughts. The man preferred black, but the black horse had a limp and was walking up. And the wife, because she knew the details, knew the facts. So he makes his decision, having heard from the body, mm -hmm. having gathered that information. And he gets the best horse. He's still the leader. But isn't it true that a good leader, the head, hears the body? Mm -hmm. Boy, if she's safe enough to be that submissive information to her, she's going to pick the best horse. Mm -hmm. So it's a good story, but fun to rewrite things. And to me, that's what the scripture does. It takes what the world is and it rewrites it. Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. Mm -hmm. He lifts up this stance. Thank you for that. I love that illustration of, of listening to the body because there's there's so many times I look back over over our married life and you know there's there's times where I would have made a decision but my wife being the detailed person she is she sees things that I didn't see so it's, it's powerful and if we can be humble enough to listen to that advice it's it's powerful. Anyone else? All right. Uh, for announcements, I've got a few announcements. Uh, we'd like to have an uh, instruction class this evening. I know we've got a very busy week this week, so we'd like to try to do it this evening if we could, maybe at 5 o'clock. Uh, if it doesn't work for you, just let us know. Uh, and also, we have prayer meeting <clears throat> Wednesday evening. And I also believe we have fish fry for Friday, Friday evening, so <clears throat> be prepared, prepared for that. Then also just a reminder <coughs> about the men's seminar coming up. I think it's on Thursday and Friday. If there's any last minute uh, guys who've decided to go along, uh, let Felix know about that. Any other announcements before we close?
February 4th. Look forward to it. All right. Any other announcements? So either either give it back to you in person or send a picture and text it to one of you or email it to put it back into one of our mailboxes. Okay. All right. Anything else? What did you say the first guy's name was? Kevin Cherry. Kevin Cherry. Okay. Let's keep them, remember them in our prayers. So, okay. Uh, this time we'll stand. And Felix, if you can dismiss us and maybe pray for those requests. Okay. I just wanted to say I, I appreciate the feedback. And um, I, I feel like a lot of times there's there's a lot that I could have said, but, you know, didn't didn't get said. And, and uh, what Paul said about ideals, that's uh, a <clears throat> good, good, good corrective thing. And uh, yeah, so yeah, just, just pray for me. We've got, I'd like to preach a few more messages on the home and one on courtship. And um, so yeah, pray for me in that regard. And um, all the feedback was good. I, I appreciate different perspectives and different views on a subject like this. And maybe if you look at the scriptures that we read about the woman's role in church, um, maybe you have some practical applications of that. So if you do, make them known. Um, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for each one gathered here. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit that illuminates what is shared and applies it to our lives. We just pray, Lord, for each one as we go from here. Help us to walk in the light. Help us to look to you for our, you're our source of life. You offer life abundantly. We want to walk in that life. We want to walk in the light as you're in the light. Draw our strength. Draw our wisdom draw our, just everything from you and walk in it. I pray, Lord, for the needs that were mentioned. I pray for Zach as he's battling with this sickness. I pray for healing for him and for this Kevin. I'm not sure what his needs are. I just pray that you would meet his needs. Go with us from here in Jesus' name. Amen.